Joining us today is Bob Kite, President of Adventist Risk Management. Bob, please uh, introduce our topic today. Hi, it's a pleasure to have you join us this afternoon on this webinar. Uh, I am Bob Kite, President of Adventist Risk Management. It's a pleasure for me to be working this afternoon with a an employment lawyer who has a specialty in that area of practice. Dion Rowe is the Associate General Counsel for the General Conference Office of General Counsel. She's an attorney who has been practicing in this area of law for many years. Prior to working for the Office of General Counsel, she was with the employment law firm of Ogletree Deacons here in the Washington, D.C. area. She's a graduate of George Washington University School of Law and I know that she's going to be sharing a lot of great insights with us this afternoon in this area of employment practices. So as we start to look and move forward into this, we're going to start at the beginning and we're going to give you a very quick overview. Uh, in some cases, we, we won't cover all the details that you'll see on the slide because they're there kind of as a checklist for you and these materials will be available online for you as well after uh, we complete this overall uh, the overall presentation. So we're going to talk about the hiring process. And Dion, why don't you tell us a little bit about what we ought to be looking at and what we ought to be avoiding as we get into the hiring practice and of, of our employment? Oh, well, thank you, Bob. First, I want to say I'm happy to be here uh, to spend some time talking with everybody. Um, as we start talking about the uh, hiring process, um, the first thing that you need to be aware of are the anti-discrimination laws that might apply to your workplace. Um, this would cover federal laws, it might be state laws, um, even local and municipal laws, which are the laws of the local jurisdiction, maybe the city that you live in or the town that you, or city that you work in or the town that you work in. Um, this is really an area that can be fraught with a lot of liability for employers if you're not careful. The main exposure really is under the federal law the Title VII um, Civil Rights Act of 1974. And this is a law that protects employees from discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, which doesn't usually apply in our context, um, sex and national origin. So basically what Title VII says is that employers can't discriminate against employees because of their association with another individual or because of their own uh, race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Um, a key thing to keep in mind when you're dealing with anti-discrimination laws is the prohibition against retaliation. So let's say, for instance, someone in the workplace brings a claim of um, discrimination that is either has a basis or doesn't have basis. You're not allowed to take any kind of adverse employment action against them because they brought that claim. So you can't demote them or fail to promote them or take any kind of negative action toward them if they bring such a claim. Is it important, Dion, as we go into the hiring process to put together documentation or is this something that can just be done off the cuff? It's absolutely essential that documentation uh, is consistently and effectively carried out during the hiring process. One of the key things is to remember to be consistent, uh, especially during the interview process. Um, it's best, I know all of you probably don't have HR departments per se, but for the person who's responsible for the HR functions, um, create some sort of checklist or uh, I guess a spreadsheet even that has questions that you ask of every candidate that is being interviewed for a similar position. Um, also another thing to keep in mind to make sure that the documentation and the process is fair is to have more than one person um, available in the interviews so that you avoid the situation of he said, she said, and there aren't any questions about what actually took place in the interview process. Um, and again, having the questions beforehand so that both people can be prepared um, is really going to help in leading towards successful interviews. Uh, another point to keep in mind is when you have these multiple people in the interviews, it's a good idea to make sure you record who is involved in the interview process and what role each person played. You know, one of the uh, things that we practice in Adventist Risk Management now is that two-person rule. And in fact, we do not conduct any interviews in Adventist Risk Management without the HR manager in the room. 
that person, our HR manager, knows the, the requirements of the law and therefore can steer the conversation away from problem areas should they come up. And I think that's very important. Absolutely. What about job descriptions? Are those of concern at all during the uh, hiring process? And how, how important really are they to the pr whole hiring process, Dion? Well, what you'll find is, and we're not going to go into detail in these the slides on job descriptions, but what you'll find is, although job descriptions aren't required by law, it really is a best practice to have them for every existing position in the organization um, and to reevaluate them every year or two, even though it seems like that's kind of a burden. The functions that, uh, the jobs that people perform change over time, sometimes drastically, sometimes subtly, but those changes really should be reflected in the job descriptions to make sure that the people are being paid according to the level of work that they're doing. Um, the purpose, of course, again, for job descriptions, uh, not only that you can use them during the interview process, but you're also going to use them during your evaluation process, which we'll touch briefly on in a little bit, a little bit later. Okay, so I've got a great candidate sitting in front of me. They really know how to present themselves in a positive way, and uh, I'm all ready to hire them. And then, of course, my HR manager wants to start doing some reference checking. How valuable is that? You know, does anybody ever tell you the truth when it comes to references? Well, Bob, I think how much truth you get out of reference checking is really going to depend on how the references are checked and the kind of questions that are asked. Um, so typically in a reference check uh, situation, from my experience in our organization, we typically confirm certain things like dates of employment, um, rates of pay, and general information like that. For the most part, we don't get into specific information about employees on a personal level because it's just not prudent to do that. Um, one of the ways to make sure that you get good information from the reference checking process is to try and start with uh, closed questions that elicit yes or no responses and then broaden out into more open-ended questions. Um, try to avoid uh, making the person that you're speaking to feel like they're being put on the spot, keep your tone conversational, um, and definitely use information that is provided to you by the candidate. It's a good way to um, test the honesty of the person that you are seeking to uh, hire or to interview. Um, try and avoid subjective questions because that one can make the person that you're gathering the information from uh, uncomfortable and it might elicit what could be considered unlawful topics. You know, one of the things I found in the uh, reference checking process is even some of the basics could be very helpful. Uh, I've, I've come across a time, and, a time or two where an individual has put on their resume or their application that they held a certain job at another organization, and when I'd gone to verify that job uh, history, they did, in fact, work at the organization, but they have enriched their job title considerably from what they actually were doing. Uh, hopefully, they're doing this, of course, to try to get the job that you have to offer, but it may come back to haunt you if you don't do the reference checking and you find out they're really not qualified based on their work history. So I think it's really important, Dion. I think you've covered this well, and I think we also need to do another kind of check that's important as well, at least in certain types of work areas. So what about criminal background checks? You keep hearing about them and there's all kinds of problems people are saying with getting them. Uh, should we be doing criminal background checks on every employee? Well, this is an area that's getting a lot of attention right now at the EEOC. Um, and the most, the soundest advice that I can provide is that if you're going to do criminal background checks, do them based on the nature of the job that you're trying to fill. Um, so for example, if you're filling a treasury position and the person is going to have significant exposure to uh, financial information and money, then that's probably a place where you would want to institute a criminal background check across all of similar positions that are uh, treasury related. So for example, if you had an, an admin assistant, you probably wouldn't subject them to a background check, but people who are going to be exposed to money across the board would need to be subjected to a background check. Um, if you're going to consider arrests and convictions, make sure that they are actually related. So for example, if someone is arrested for, um, let's say, arrested and convicted of reckless driving, 
but there's no driving related to their job, that's probably not an offense that you would need to take into consideration in your criminal background check. Um, know what your state laws are. Again, apply them consistently. Um, follow the Fair Credit Reporting Act and other local laws. And one of the big things to take away from the Fair Credit Reporting Act is that you must have written authorization before you conduct a criminal background check. You know, one of the areas that Adventist Risk Management is working on is especially in the area of child protection. So that's an important Absolutely. area of background check. Uh, we're, we're recommending Shield the Vulnerable. It doesn't need to be that organization that does your background check. But obviously, if you're working in a school system or working in a daycare or even in an organization where there's a lot of exposure to young children and that coming into your organization, you need to find out whether you have uh, somebody who's applied for the job that's a sex offender or, or what the background is. Uh, that seems like a highly unlikely situation, but it really isn't. We've we have found and had people call us, denominational employers who have hired people only to discover later that they have hired a sex offender who is a registered sex offender and it raises all kinds of complications for the employment situation if they're working with young people and those types of things. So good advice uh, Dion. Let's, let's move on to an area that everybody's always interested in and that's the area of compensation and benefits. Uh, this is an important part of employment law today, and how do we go about addressing the overall issues of compensation? Well, Bob, the best way to address compensation and to uh, get it in front of your employees is during your orientation process, which hopefully all of you have in place for your new employees. Um, so when the person is hired and they go and you have them sitting there for their um, orientation, Make sure that they have something in writing that details for them what their compensation plan involves. You may have already sent them some basic information in their offer letter. Um, know what the requirements are in your state. You'll see that uh, knowing your state law come up in a lot of these slides in a lot of different contexts. Um, make sure that if you, they know that if they're going to have withholdings from their pay and their compensation that they have to be in writing, they have to authorize them in writing. Um, make them aware that in the event that they have any kind of garnishments or adjustments to pay, well garnishments particularly, um, it may be up to 25 percent of their pay and typically something like a garnishment isn't going to go into play unless there is a court order or perhaps an education garnishment. Um, salary adjustments, one thing to keep in mind with respect to compensation and salary adjustments is that as an organization we tend to give regular um, merit increases or cost of living increases I should say. Keep in mind that if you regularly giving cost of living increases it can be interpreted by employees that their performance is satisfactory so if you're going to adjust salaries it's a good idea on a regular basis it's a good idea to have a provision in your handbook that explains that these are the salary adjustments that you make that are not tied to your the employee's performance so that they don't so we don't find ourselves in a place where we have a contractual agreement to provide um, salary increases. You know another aspect of this uh, Dion too is that when you get written authorization to do withholdings make sure you do the withholdings and that you process everything correctly. I was in a, a meeting this week and Dell Johnson, the head of the North American Division Retirement Plan, was mentioning to the group that if you have a withdraw a withholding certificate from an employee signed and you don't with, withhold their retirement appropriately, the employer can be on the line for a number of penalties and actually some of the actual withholdings that, that the employee would have given. So be very careful in following through on that. Let, let's look at another area, and that is that, you know, we've always got lots of people who are willing to volunteer and, you know, stay late and uh, go off the clock and all that kind of stuff in the church organization. What kind of problems are we getting into under uh, the, the Fair Labor Standards Act for overtime pay? Well, one of the things that caught my attention what you said is people are going off the clock and working. Let's just say right up front that that is not an acceptable uh, practice. If people are working, especially non-exempt employees who we typically call uh, hourly employees, they must be paid for all the time that they're worked. They work. Um, additionally, when you're looking at overtime in places other than California, 
um, the well, let me back up a little bit. For overtime, the calculation is one and a half times the regular wage of a uh, uh, regular hourly wage for all hours worked that are 40 or more in a work week. For non-exempt employees, again, these are hourly employees. There is no such thing as comp time. I know a few years back, comp time was a big concept, and instead of uh, paying people for the time they work, you would just give them time off. Um, that is not an acceptable practice in the context of non-exempt employees. Now, what you can do if you have employees that are coming up on their 40 hours and you don't want them to go over those hours, you can give them some time off. But if they work in excess of 40 hours in a work week, then you must pay them overtime for that. Be careful out in California, though, because overtime is calculated on a daily basis, not on a weekly basis. And it's really important that you really sit down and think through some of these, especially those who have local church employees involved. I know that uh, a lot of local churches have an expectation that their, their secretary for their local church will open the office for a couple of hours Sabbath morning to run bulletins and various other things. And that's a, with an expectation that since it's Sabbath, they don't get paid. I think they're in big trouble doing that, Dion. As you've said, there is no off-the-clock work. And even if the employee volunteers to be off the clock to do that, I advise against it, as I know you do, because sooner or later you could have a disgruntled employee, and the, the penalties under the Fair Labor Standard Act are very favorable to the employee against the employer. So I think that's a real critical area. True. And then the other category, um, in addition to the non-exempt employees are the exempt employees. Those are the ones that we typically refer to as salaried. And salaried people don't keep track of their hours. They work until the work is done. Um, they're paid a full salary for any week in which work is done. And exempt employees can actually have comp time as long as the time off is during the same pay period. If you start to stretch it out beyond that pay period, then you're running into a situation where you have to actually keep track of the hours of an exempt employee and then if you're keeping track of hours of an exempt employee, you start to run into a situation where the government might find that that person is not actually exempt, they're not exempt, and then you're back into the overtime situation again. Also, deductions for um, exempt employees typically are made for pay, from pay only with respect to unexcused absences from work. If you uh, don't keep track of the overtime for your uh, employees, such as your non-exempt employees, the federal government looks at it and allows the employee to give you give them the number of hours that they believe they worked overtime and that's what they'll use so uh, be careful in your documentation let's take a final look at benefits Dion what have you got to share on that I'm um, just a couple brief things one again is that the law does not require that we provide benefits but if we do we need to make sure that we provide the same benefits for similarly similarly situated employees so, for example, um, in the North American Division, exempt employees receive a tuition benefit. Non-exempt employees do not, and that's a perfectly lawful distinction to make as long as each category, exempt and non-exempt, are treated the same way. Um, again, cover benefits in employee or orientation. And one thing that I see often is that uh, in employee handbooks, which we'll get to shortly, um, we often tend to put way too much benefit information in the handbook. Have that information available to your employees with your HR person, um, but don't put a lot of detail about benefits in your employee handbook. Good comments. And uh, one of the things with the new uh, health care laws coming into effect that you have to be careful with is you can't make distinguishing health care plans based on well, this person is doing this kind of work versus the other, because those are going to be a problem under the new Health Care Act. You talked about employee handbooks. Uh, these, this is a mixed uh, situation, because aren't you afraid, Dion, that when you have that handbook, pretty soon people are going to rely on it and act like it's their contract for employment? Well, having an employee handbook can actually be interpreted as a contract if it's not carefully drafted. Um, that being said, having an employee handbook is actually an excellent idea um, because it does a few things. One, it sets forth your expectations for your employees and lets them know how they're supposed to conduct themselves. Um, it describes to the employees what they can expect from the organization. 
Um, and it also lets employees know what the organization's legal obligations are as an employer. So with respect to non-discrimination, equal employment, um, things of that nature. Um, in terms of drafting an employee handbook, there are certain policies at a minimum that should be included in the handbook and we're just going to touch briefly on a few of those in the next two slides. Um, the first major group are your anti-discrimination policies. Um, as we all know, we have to comply with the equal employment opportunity laws that prohibit discrimination. And so your handbook should have a section that covers all of these types of policies. You want a section covering compensation. This section is going to explain to the employees um, the required deductions that you're going to make under federal law, under state law, um, any voluntary deductions that have to do with the benefits that are provided to the employee. Um, it's also going to cover pay, overtime pay, which we just touched on, the pay schedules, uh, performance reviews, salary increases, what the timekeeping requirements are, uh, work schedules, standards of conduct, meaning how people are to conduct themselves in the workplace, out of the workplace, because even outside of the workplace it's a reflection on who you are as an employee at your uh, organization and general employment information. This is kind of a broad category, but it's going to cover everything from employment eligibility to job classification, um, probationary periods, reviews, termination, discipline, all of those things can fall under this general employee information category. Then we also want to have safety and security, which uh, that's pretty self-explanatory, the things that will go under there. Computers and technology, this is where you want to have your computer and software use policies. Um, steps that employees should take to secure their electronic information. Um, media relations, it's a good idea to have one key person or one single point for media in inquiries. Um, explain what employ the employee's role should be if an inquiry comes in and how they should handle that. Um, as we touched on employee benefits, again in this section of the employee handbook it's going to be very general information and it's going to refer the employee to the HR department or the HR designee in the organization. Also your leave policies. This will be where your FMLA, Family and Medical Leave Act, will go, um, any kind of jury leave, parental leave, uh, military leave, any kind of leave will go under this leave policy. And the last bullet you'll see in red, it's not necessarily a section of the employee handbook, but it's going to come at the end, and that's the signed acknowledgement. And this is a really key point. Um, you want to have a signed acknowledgement for your employee handbook, and not only are you having employees sign that they've received it, but you're also having them sign that they have, they're going to read, and that they, when they read, they understand what the content of the employee handbook is, and that they agree to buy by, abide by what's in the employee handbook. And then later, if you have um, any questions, or if a question arises or a challenge arises regarding whether or not they were aware of what the policies were and their obligations, there won't be any question about that. Okay. Well, that's the uh, the fast one for handbooks. Yeah. And uh, if in jurisdictions where you have at-will employment, uh, your legal counsel should review, of course, your handbook before it goes out. And they'll want to make sure they stress in there that this is not a contract, that it's an at-will jurisdiction so that they can uh, enforce that and keep that at-will provision alive. Uh, at-will simply means that an employer or an employee can terminate the employee relationship for any reason, provided it's not an illegal reason uh, at any time. So let's move on to another tough to topic, really, the review, discipline, and termination. And one of the things that I know in Adventist Risk Management, we've just gone through our complete evaluation process of all of our employees. How important is the performance evaluation? I think the performance evaluation might be an underutilized tool, but it's really a tool that um, has the potential to be very powerful and contribute positively both to your employees and the organization. Um, we're not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but some things to keep in mind is that when you create um, the performance evaluation process, if you don't have one, make sure that your evaluation mechanisms relate specifically to the job functions that, of the person that are going to be evaluated, of the person who's going to be evaluated. 
make sure that the people who are evaluating are properly trained on whatever system you put in place. Um, make sure that you have a descriptive rating scale and what that means is that the ratings that the evaluator has to choose from are reflective of the skills that are needed for the job. Um, bullet number four, insist on accuracy. Uh, performance evaluation really is not going to be worth anything at all if it does not accurately reflect the work performed by the person being evaluated and all too often I see situations where employees are marked as exceptional workers but then three months later uh, the person, the supervisor wants to terminate the employee because they're not performing well but all of the documentation says that the, prefer the person is performing exceptionally well. So you you're really have to make sure that your evaluation mechanism accurately reflects even if it's difficult and sometimes it's hard to tell people they're not doing well but we have to do that anyway. Last bullet, establishing checks uh, and balances. If you have the personnel available it's sometimes a, a good idea to have um, a third party involved in the performance evaluation so that you have an objective view but also a view of someone who is has first-hand knowledge of the person who's being evaluated. Um, next bullet, providing an opportunity for review. If you have employees that are uh, don't have the best employee evaluation, a performance evaluation, give them an opportunity to fix what's wrong Make sure it's detailed in specific language that they can understand, that they know what the objective outcomes are after their period of review is over. Like we did with the employee handbook, you need to have a signed acknowledgement or an agreement that the person at least is aware of what has taken place in the review and hopefully that they agree with it. Um, be fair in the process. It's not always possible to have an appeals process, but if you do have one, make sure that the appeals are based on merit and not just on the form of what's in the, the review. They can't just be unhappy with it and want to appeal. They need to have a really concrete reason that's um, available to them. Stick to a schedule. If you say performance evaluations are going to be done on an annual basis, make sure you stick to that schedule. Um, but at the same time, in your employee handbooks, when you're discussing what the evaluation schedule is, make sure you use language such as the performance evaluations will typically be held annually um, so that you don't get locked into a contractual situation so that if for some reason the organization doesn't do them annually you won't find yourself being held liable for that. Great, co great counsel Dion. Uh, one of the observations I make to the managers here in Adventist Risk Management is that we do have an annual review of all of our employees but don't delay on discipline issues and that till the annual review. In fact, I tell them that if the at the annual review evaluation should not be the first time an employee hears that they have a problem because that only creates a real morale problem and a discipline problem going forward. Right. Uh, we're going to look next at, at actual employee discipline. Tell us how, how should we be handling this and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about progressive discipline here. Well, there are various schools of thought on in as to how discipline should be carried out in the workplace. Some people think there should be an, a progressive discipline process where you have verbal warnings, written warnings, and you pro progressively get more serious with, with the discipline. Um, other organizations prefer that you just have more of a process with discretion and, and fairness. Um, either, either process works. I think when you have progressive discipline, you have to be careful because, again, you can get locked in to uh, having to follow a particular plan and then not having the room for discretion or if you don't follow the particular steps that you set out then an employee can bring a claim that well this is what you said you were going to do and you didn't do it and then you have a problem so whatever process you pick make sure you are consistent and you follow it um, and then also keep in mind the uh, Y36 in the North American Division working policy that covers termination settlements yeah, that's good advice, and, and one of the things I would add is that if you're going to put something in your handbook, make sure you understand that whatever you put in there, you're going to have to live with it. And one of the concerns I have with too detailed a progressive discipline is that very issue of following your own corporate due process to make sure that you haven't stepped out of bounds there. 
And that sometimes can be very problematic. So I think you need to carve out exceptions to progressive discipline for certain, especially egregious types of conduct, so that you don't have to go through all of those steps, uh, especially if there are moral or, or illegal activities or those types of things. Termination, not something we like to do, uh, but certainly something that happens from time to time. Dion, give us a, a brief comment or two on that one. Um, the first bullet kind of sums it all up. Document, document, document. Again, it's going to go, when you're dealing with termination situation, your documentation might go all the way back to the hiring process. It might go back to just the performance evaluation process. But whatever it is that's related to the termination, you need to make sure that it's documented accurately and documented in a timely fashion. Um, Bob, you touched briefly on at will. Um, again, as Bob said, most of the jurisdictions that we carry out our work in are at will, but you have to be very careful in applying this. So if you say, well, I'm just terminating you because, and you don't give a reason, then a creative uh, plaintiff's attorney is going to come in and create whatever reasons they think are reasonable under the law, and then you're going to find yourself facing more legal challenges than are necessary. Um, one thing to keep in mind is don't fire people on the spot if you can absolutely help it. I mean, for really egregious um, instances, of course, you might have to do that. But try to address the poor performance through the evaluation process. Um, and even if you have an immediate termination, um, there can be a process for that as well. So suspend the person perhaps with pay, go through your investigation and whatever it is that you need to do, and then terminate them and make sure that all your ducks are in a row. Good points. We're going to keep moving quickly. We're coming to the end of our time, but we've got a few more points we just want to touch on uh, for the audience. Uh, the other key workplace issues, I'm a little concerned about this heading, Dion, because I didn't know there was legal harassment, <laughs> but uh, preventing illegal harassment, a very important part in today's uh, society and how we look at that and how it should be dealt with. Give us a, a summary on that one, Dion. Bottom line is you need to have a, a policy, you need to have a zero tolerance policy, um, and you need to make sure that it's in writing. The purpose of that policy being, one, letting employees know the type of conduct that is prohibited. Um, and this, this zero tolerance policy will come into effect as a defense to the organi organization in the event that the organization is ever sued for harassment. Um, your policy should require reporting to the designated individuals, whether it's HR, um, the supervisor. It should explain what the employee's rights are so that they understand that, yes, while they have an obligation to report, they also have protections in place for them. Your policy is also going to outline the investigation procedure, describe what the consequences will be um, if uh, harassment is found, um, and also it keep in mind that it should provide multiple ways for a person to report. So, For example, if the supervisor is the person who is accused of harassing the employee, then you need to have another avenue in place ahead of time so that the supervisor can be um, circumvented and you can go directly to the next higher authority. Good suggestions. One thing I'd suggest you have is in the make sure in the reporting process you have uh, personnel from both genders that are represented for the reporting. Uh, for example, if you have a female HR director and you have a male who is complaining of sexual harassment in the workplace, he may not be comfortable going to the female HR manager. So make sure you have, uh, have that well covered as, as well. Okay, we're going to move to another important topic, and in fact, uh, I'm just telling you up front, we've already invited Dion to come back and do a, an ADA webinar because there's just so much to cover in this area, but she's just going to give you a snapshot. Uh, th this is the primer for her next webinar. <laughs> yeah, so really with the ADA process, um, make sure that you have your local legal counsel involved. The key is going to be that you actually engage in what's called the uh, the the process, the accommodation process. Um, you want to want to meet with the employee. You want to offer or consider what might be reasonable accommodations. There's several things you're going to take into consideration: financial and administrative considerations. Um, keep in mind that you don't have to engage in any kind of accommodation that's going to be an undue hardship to the organization, meaning it's going to require them to spend a lot of extra money 
or something of that nature. Also keep in mind that when you're going through this ADA process, this really is not the time to deal with performance issues. That should be kept in the performance evaluation process. This is really just a process to help employees find a way to uh, be accommodated in case they have some sort of issue that keeps them from performing the essential functions of their job because of some sort of disability or perceived disability. Um, carefully document the analysis that you go through in reaching whatever conclusion. Show the alternatives that you considered in case you face a challenge later. And again, you're going to want to make sure the analysis and the decision that you reach are in writing. Okay, like I said, there's a lot of detail up in behind this one, and we're going to do a more detailed uh, uh, drill down on that in the future. I just want to touch on risk management issues just very briefly. Uh, your insurance coverage for, for employment law will, will cover many of these issues uh, if, as far as any litigation or there are concerns. However, keep in mind that in just about every insurance policy involving employment law, there's a requirement now, and there is through GenCon Insurance Company, that you seek outside legal counsel before you take a discipline action such as termination. That safeguards you in the overall process. Uh, we ask that you get competent local jurisdiction legal counsel to assist you with that so that they know the state laws and they know the impact of it. The other thing we encourage you to do is report potential claims early. Keep in mind that when you report a claim or a potential claim and that that claim never happens, it does not impact your insurance rates. So get involved early with the, uh, with if it's through Adventist Risk Management, our Claims Council. Uh, that, the fact that you're working with our Claims Council does not incur any loss expenses just directly from that. And then, of course, as, as Dion has pointed out, documentation and fairness are important and avoid pretext or disparate impact because attorneys representing your employees will look at those very carefully. So don't say that you're, you're terminating someone because the job has gone away when, in essence, the job hasn't gone away and, and six weeks later you're hiring a replacement. At the same time, don't say, well, we're, we're letting 20 people go in the company and the, dis the disparate treatment that comes up or impact comes up is that they dis that's discovered that all of the people that were let go were over 50 years of age and you have an age discrimination issue. So those are some of the things that are important in the overall coverage issues. And if you've got questions, we're very happy to, to respond to those. You can call our claims counsels or we can uh, handle it in any way that we can. And I'm sure that Dion, if you've got a question from a conference or an institution, you can reach out to Dion at the Office of General Counsel. Are there any questions for us today, David? We're kind of breezing quickly. Well, there is one question, and I think you just answered it in your, your last comment there. It's from Andrew. He was asking, for those who do not have an HR department but perform HR functions, do, can you point to a resource where such people can get the type of information being shared here today? Sure. And I think, I think that generally we, we do not do your legal work for the client simply because we're not licensed in your jurisdictions. But I know that Dion Rowe in the Office of General Counsel can give you good instruction and assistance. Uh, you can contact our managing claims counsel here is Bob Burrow, uh, who I think a lot of you know, and I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you, or the attorney that's assigned from ARM in your territory. And we can either help you directly or get you uh, lined up with somebody in your jurisdiction that can help. Uh, that wraps up our presentation for today, David. And uh, back over to you now, and I want to thank Dion for the time and uh, the good advice she shared this afternoon with the group. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Dion and Bob.